Oh my gosh. All right, we're back. <laughs> I ended. Sure, let me go grab it. I got to set up this tripod down there. And uh, I am going to uh, the table. Yeah. Let me go. Just let me set this up and so I can get out of the way. Jess, I still haven't. I still haven't broke down about a new tripod. I need to. I don't know because I don't have time. <laughs> guys pray for me that I get myself together. <laughs> Find the time to do the things I should be doing, right? <laughs> okay. So that park rose looks really good. <laughs> or the park the park line looks really good, doesn't it? <laughs> Maybe. Really? Hello. I swear. Um, that has one for the bird. Do you have some that doesn't? Yeah. Do you need a bird? Uh, this one doesn't. Yes. They all clean children. That one's just not good for me. Um, that's There. For goodness sakes, guys. Oh. Can I? Okay. No, it's not. Okay, very well. Okay. Hi, Della. Hi, honey. Um, come down here and visit us at Fortune and Bannock. Um, having a having a speaker here talking about what? I missed the toilet. Really? How many did you make? I missed the toilet. You're all glad, she says. There's two toilets left? Oh, there's two toilets left. Let's look at these. Here, shut it. Oh. <laughs> I am having a hard time, Jess. Okay. No toilets. <laughs> look, there's two left. Yeah. How about it? Short and tall. This is awesome. Yeah. Miriam made these, right? Yep. And some either mulch or kitty litter. Oh, really? Mulch or what? Kitty litter. Kitty litter. And then those are disposable um, or biodegradable bags, right? Okay, guys. I, I, okay. <clears throat> Take a breath, breathe. Breathe, Carol, breathe. Come on. Breathe. <laughs> That's what we have to do, right? Hi, Lucy. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> Jill. Jill. Hey, J hey, fellow Justice Warrior. How are you? Okay. Now, let me get my stuff together. Oh, 
I'm just coming back tomorrow. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm just coming back. How are you off to do? No idea where I'll be. Um, but I'm going to be at, like, the Peter Bowl. I don't know where I'm going.
like a block party here.
So any questions about what we mean when we say secondary trauma? Okay. So let's talk about what we can do about this, okay? Because the goal is for each and every one of you to continue to be able to be sustained in the work that you do. The first thing, and this is why I thank Jess for covering this topic tonight, is that we have to be able to acknowledge it. Often people feel ashamed or embarrassed. Who am I to say that I'm struggling when the people I'm helping are struggling so much more, right? We almost feel like we should be superhuman. We should be able to suck it up and just be okay. So people don't talk about this. They suffer in silence, right? And so it starts to eat away and eat away and eat away until we can't ignore it anymore. And sometimes we're completely burned out, right? Or sometimes we only notice it when a doctor says, you're really having health effects from this and it's almost too late, right? So the first thing we'd say a lot in psychology, name it to tame it. We have to be able to say out loud without shame or embarrassment when we're tired right, when we're struggling, when we're experiencing things that we don't understand. And we have to say it to each other, right? We have to be able to create space for each other to acknowledge the struggle and acknowledge the fatigue if we're going to be able to do something about it. And we have to give ourselves permission to acknowledge that. The other piece is we have to look at how we're thinking about this phenomenon. If we look at it as a sign of weakness, I should be stronger, shouldn't be experiencing these things, I shouldn't be feeling this way, we're never gonna do anything about it. So we have to acknowledge that it is just part of the territory, right? That as human beings, we're just as susceptible to this as any other person. Doesn't mean we're not a good helper, doesn't mean we're not here for the right reasons, but we are human and our brains change sometimes too. We then have to think about what self-care means for helpers. And we often use that phrase and it's kind of thrown around, we gotta do self-care, we gotta do self-care without really knowing what that means. It has to mean something tangible, right? If you don't recognize that self-care is the only way that you're going to continue to be able to help, you're framing it incorrectly, right? So we have to get the narrative right. We have to be able to call self-care critical in order to actually follow through. There tend to be three buckets that self-care falls into if we're going to try to protect the brain, right? The first is physical activity. You don't have to go run a marathon, but we have to take care of our basic bodies, right? We have to move. We have to exercise, right? Whether that's walking, running, I don't care what it is, but we know that our brains are not healthy if our bodies are not healthy. They're fundamentally connected. We also know that connection matters. You are all here because you're part of a community, right? As human beings, we are hardwired to need each other, right? What we do though, when we're struggling, is we withdraw, we shut down, right? We kind of go away from people. So what we wanna do is when we notice that we're struggling, we need to connect even more. We need to fight that inner battle that's telling us shut down, withdraw, separate from others and actually seek out ways of connecting. What that looks like to each of you may vary, right? But it does require being vulnerable and saying, I need you, you need me. We need to maintain this sense of community. The third is play, right? If you look at any mammal in all of our world, all mammals play, right? Dolphins play in the waves. Little chimpanzees throw apples at each other, right? It is critical that even if you have devoted your life to helping others that you give yourself permission to do things that you want to do not just that you have to do and not feel selfish about that not feel guilty about that because if you don't take care of that human need right to enjoy aspects of life your brain is going to quite frankly shift into the state i'm talking about accountability matters finding what I call helper buddies, right? Saying to, to each other, we need to hold each other accountable to this. We need to check in with each other. How are we doing on these categories that she talked about? How, are, how can we create time that we are spending together, physically active, doing something we enjoy, or just sharing time together? Okay. Any questions about that so far, or thoughts about that?
The other thing that becomes really, really important is knowing when to ask for help and when to seek professional help. And one thing I'd be happy to do, you know, with Jess is give you guys some ideas about that because sometimes I know as a behavioral health provider, it is very challenging to access help, even if you have all the resources in the world, right? And then if you don't have all the resources in the world, it becomes even more challenging. So not being afraid to acknowledge when you need support and then knowing what those resources are to access that support also becomes important. What we know about either direct trauma or secondary trauma is that it is not one of these things that time heals. Actually, it's usually the opposite. With time, these symptoms usually get worse, right? And so getting support early on before things get too overwhelming is when we know that we can be the most helpful. Okay. But getting the right type of support. The other thing we know that actually, again, from studying these brain scans that helps the brain stay in a sustainable place is the power of ritual, right? Having a routine, having things that you do to acknowledge that all the ways that you help probably are not going to be enough in the sense that we have so many problems in this world, right? And that's the part that often keeps people up at night. That's the part that often drives some of these symptoms is I'm doing everything I can, right? I'm working so hard and I know I'm scratching the surface. I know there is so much trauma out there. There is so much hardship and I can't do it all. Can't do enough. That feeling of I'm not enough, right? And so whatever that ritual looks like to you, whether it's at the end of the day, if you're someone who is spiritual or religious, right? Saying a prayer for all the people who are struggling that you aren't coming into direct contact with. If that's not your mindset, right? Sending off a well wish, right? I wish all the people who are struggling well. That might sound so insignificant, so minute, right? But it's an acknowledgement that there is so, there's so much out there that is overwhelming that we can't touch and we're aware of it and we see it and we are hoping right that everyone whether we come into direct contact with them or not can be well right and there's something incredibly powerful about having that daily acknowledgement that we know is also protective of the brain so you may be sitting here thinking of other rituals or routines that you do maybe even without calling them that that you find helpful but we know that identifying which of those rituals and routines helps you absolutely is protective for the brain. So kind of the summary of all of that is that secondary trauma, right, or compassion fatigue or help or burnout is not some made up fluffy term, right? It's a real thing. We can see it on imaging, right? We know it has direct links to health and emotional health effects. And there are these very specific things we can do to buffer the brain from some of the most significant effects of this. The other thing I want to tell you guys is that a lot of this comes down to this concept of empathy, right? Empathy, by definition, is feeling with someone else, okay? In hearing your story, I am truly connecting with you enough that I hear what you're going through, right? I witness your life. I witness your story. Anyone who is a helper probably has an above average empathy response. You probably self-select into that because you care. Well, here's the cruel trick of nature, right? We also know from these brain scans that people who have stronger empathy responses also are most vulnerable to these brain changes that cause problems. So you self-select into something because you care, you can connect with other human beings, you're empathetic, and you're at more risk than other human beings for all these health effects we're talking about, right? So the answer to that is not to shut down and not care and not connect to people, right? The answer is to acknowledge that this is a real thing, that you are not weak for struggling, right? And for saying, I need to give the same care to myself that I give to other people in my world I care about, right? And to direct that empathy, to direct that caring nature to yourself as well. So those are kind of the main things. This is a huge topic, you guys. We've done like four day workshops on this, right? So this is like scratching the surface of something much bigger. My hope today is that if you're listening to this, you have a little bit of a vocabulary 
to frame some of maybe your own experiences or experiences you've seen in others. Maybe it gives you permission to kind of own what you're noticing in yourself or to check in with other people about it without any kind of judgment or shame or embarrassment. And to really think about your own narrative. How are you thinking about self-care? Is it some nice fluffy afterthought? Or are you defining it as absolutely critical to your own health and well-being and to your ability to care for others long-term? So it's about getting the narrative right. It's about actually doing tangible things that protect your brain and protect your body as you care for others. And it's about the follow-through and the sustainability. And that's where I think through community, you can keep each other accountable. Thoughts or questions on any of that? Yeah. Um, what are some signs that people can look out for? Because I think people kind of, especially within like the mutual aid realm, like you go like helping, helping, helping and go and like sometimes people can't even like identify when they're at that burnout. So what are some like recommendations for people to be aware of that? So she's asking about kind of how to look out for it. And I think I'm hearing you both in yourself and others, right? And I will tell you- How can I look out for it? (laughs) So people, and I will tell you that people in the helping community are notorious for ignoring the early signs because they're inconvenient. I don't want to admit that I need to stop and slow down and do something differently. That's not convenient. I want to keep going. So often those initial signs are subtle and we ignore them, right? Consciously or unconsciously. So I would say, I always tell people it's back to the biological basics. Sleep, appetite, and mood, right? And energy levels. So you may probably not noticing other people's sleep patterns, but you may notice that in yourself. That's one of the first things to go. Either you're waking up multiple times in the night, whether with nightmares or without, maybe you're just lying awake at night, finally you can lay down and sleep, but your brain's not having it. It's going, I call it the hamster wheel of thought, right, you can't turn it off. Um, Often in other people, what we notice are kind of those subtle mood shifts. Something that maybe would annoy them a little bit now is causing a big irritable reaction, right? Often it's also, I call it like the glaze, right? So I'm talking to you and you're, you're listening, you're not doing anything else, but I can tell you're somewhere else, right? And you can maybe tell you're somewhere else too. It's that moment of like, I didn't hear a word you just said to me. Uh Uh-oh, right? So it's kind of like that almost dissociation, but in a very mild sense, like I'm distracted. I'm thinking about other things, right? And you can pick that up in the people that you know. You can see that look, right? People stop taking care of themselves, right? Hey, you need to go take a break, get some water, go eat something. Nope, 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 I gotta go, 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 right? And now people are going way too long without those basics. So that basic self-care starts to become an afterthought. Those are the, I would say, some of the most obvious things that you can see probably in yourself and in others. And I would also say creating a culture amongst helpers of sort of giving permission to point that out to each other, right? That if I say to you, hey, are you okay? You know, you've seemed a little bit distracted for you not to take that as some attack right, or, or me criticizing you, but to create a culture amongst each other where that's considered helpful, right? We're giving that type of feedback to each other is coming from a place of love and care and that it's received that way and given that way. I think is critical as a community to creating a safe space to notice and point out those signs. Does that help? No, definitely. What other questions or thoughts do you all have? What are, um, so kind of like if you, like, let's say, like, we're in this space, someone is like, kind of like reaching out to you, like, hey, I'm at this like moment of burnout, like, what do you recommend for people to like, kind of like help each other out? Like, in like, as you said, like in that respectful way, so like, what are those resources that you recommend? So I would say the first thing is this idea of creating space, right? That if you are coming to me and saying I'm struggling, I don't want to jump immediately to fix it mode do this, this, and this, right? Because that's probably not what you need. Probably the first thing you need is to feel heard and connected with and acknowledged, right? So I think the first thing, if somebody comes to you acknowledging that, is to create that space and say, thank you for telling me, right? I'm so glad that you shared that with me. Let's tell me more about that, right? So to create that space for somebody to just get that out of their head and into the space in front of them. I think then asking them, what do you need? They may not know, but they may say, actually, what I need is to just go take a walk and talk to you for a second, right? Or what I need is to actually 
just have a moment, right, to, to get some water. Can you get me some water? Right? So asking people to help you if there is something specific that they know they need, give them permission to ask for it. If they don't, giving some potential suggestions. Would it be helpful if we just take a walk and you talk with me? Is there something tangible I can do for you? Right? Can I help you with a meal? Can I help, you know, so going through some of the ways that, can I help you access resources? I may not know them, but I can ask someone who might, right? So I think giving people the space, giving people permission to ask for what they need, even if they don't know, to kind of think about it, and then offering some of those concrete and less concrete ways that you can offer assistance is probably the most helpful. And if you're asking for help, thinking about what do I need from people? And if what you need is just to be heard, to say, I'm not looking for a solution, I'm not looking for an answer, I'm just looking for an ear, right? Would you be that for me? So to be able to kind of help people know how to help you is also really important. You guys are helpers. You're gonna wanna fix it, right? You're gonna wanna fix this for people. So let them know if that's not what you need. I just want space to talk. Um, kind of just one more follow-up. I mean, especially just kind of like within the realm, a lot, I mean, a lot of us are like working class and kind of like having like accessible resources. Like, do you kind of know like accessible, like even like free resources for yeah. people to kind of like guide in that and route? That's, I am happy to put together a list for okay. Jess, so I do. Awesome. Um, where I work right now, we work with people from all different walks of life and kind of socioeconomic levels. And yeah. so I have several resources, you know, that are, that are free or, you know, reasonably affordable and I'm happy to put together a list and provide that to you guys awesome. and then you know I, I I'm a helper too right? I yeah. want to be helpful so if you look at that or like oh, I was looking for this thing I don't see it on there ask me because I have a lot of friends too who may know of a resource I don't um, and so I'm happy to help track down stuff if you guys are looking for something specific and don't see it there yeah. oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay. in that list could you uh, include maybe queer trans Yes, color, absolutely. Uh, yes, hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that's my overview. Um, if you guys think of follow-up questions or there is anything else that I can be helpful with or track down for you all, she knows how to reach me. Um, so definitely let me know. But you know, I have so much respect for everybody here, and you know, I think the goal is to create sustainable. <laughs> Help, help, right? And and that doesn't mean quick fixes often. That means looking in the mirror and really thinking about what do I need to change to be able to think about this differently, take care of myself differently, to be able to be there long term. Um, so it's a process, right? It's not a checklist. It's a process. Yeah. Um, I guess something just kind of came to mind when you were speaking. Um, one thing that I think I often struggled with was the definition of self-care and how I defined it for myself. Yeah. And I felt like after a while I started stressing myself out with my self-care, you know? And I'm yes. like, what in the world, you know? I'm like, I'm not doing this perfectly or I'm not doing yes. enough or I'm not, you know? And so it's kind of doing this perfectionism thing yes. onto my self-care. And what I've really learned, I think, and learning still is even just making parts of my already, my part of my day, but just being um, very present for those yes. and saying like, thank you, I do love this part of my day. Like this feels good, it's nourishing. Um, yeah, you know, like I love what my two, I make like nice little coffees for myself in the morning. Those are very intentional. In my day was like a tea I really like, and I try to do that every day. And it's like I was gonna do that anyways, but now if I feel like if I center it a little differently, if I take 15 minutes and read a book while doing those things, it had a whole different effect by day. So we actually call that linking, which is linking self-care to already what's happening in your day. And we find that people are much more sustainable when they do that. And I was smiling under my mask when you said that because I do the same thing, right? Like I'm stressing myself out about self-care, you know, and at this point it's all undermined. So you're right. I think if it feels like one more to do or it feels like I've got to check these boxes, it may work for a week. It's like the New Year's Eve phenomenon. Okay, I've got my resolutions this year. I'm going to plow through them and by February 1st, they're out the window, right? If you say what you're saying, which is 
how can I do my day with a little bit more of the spirit of self-care? Yeah. How can I be a little more present, not by adding another connection, but by connecting with the connections already in my day? Yeah. How do I drink that water or drink that tea, but with a little more presence, right? You're probably gonna be better off than if you're trying to add 10 more things. Yeah. So I think it's a very, very good point. Um, and I think it's it's all about sustainability and how you build it into your day in a way that you can continue. Well, so I think it's a great point. Sustainability, but also like you know, I just feel like it's also something that you see people on spending a lot of money on. You know, crystal, which I mean, you know, have fun. Sure. But like, if you're doing, you know, sometimes you get with essential oils and crystals and tea bags and you know whatever else, journals, all this stuff. It's like you can get spend a lot of money a lot doing of money, it and right. not be any happy. And I think often that backfires, like I spent all this money or I spent all this time and I'm not any happier, so I'm mad about that, yeah. right? And so we can sort of create more of a problem when we feel like we're investing all this time or resources and we're not ending up anywhere happier, right? Yeah. And I think the other point with that is sort of it has to be values driven, right? What is self-care for me is going to be different than any of you, yeah. right? Because my kind of what drives me and fulfills me may be slightly different. So. Yeah. It's not about like reading the best book on self-care and doing what this person says. It's about saying, what sustains me, right? What would be meaningful to add into my day that feels like it's a values-driven choice? And I think when you take a values-driven approach, it's more personalized and it's more sustainable and meaningful as well. Yeah, totally. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much thank for you. hosting me and um, yeah, I really, I'm here. If, if other questions come up or whatever, let me know. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Okay, we're gonna set this back up over here. So, um, that's awesome. All right, there we go. gotta get back over there. Get some tests done. So come down and get your. Um, get you a free COVID test today. It's part of self care, guys. It's part of self care. Come and get your free COVID test. <sighs> Take care of yourself <sighs> and the community, right? We can do this. We can do this. Okay. I don't know. So sad. So sad. I'm trying to. <laughs> it's okay. We'll be fine. We'll be fine, right? <laughs> okay.
Tested. Who's coming to visit me? Who's coming to visit me to get their test? Oh, okay. If I could get this thing back together. I tried to put tape on it and it made it worse. I know. I know. This is like electric, electrical tape. Or something, but it's like made it worse. Because it's not fitting. You know what the real solution is? <laughs> To go buy a new one. <laughs> that would be the real solution. Okay. Okay, let's see here. There we go. I think I can get it now. Maybe. Maybe. Why am I having such trouble with this? Gosh, okay. There we go. I'm doing good. How are you doing, hon? Hi, Christy. Christy. Christy, you're not here. You're not here. You're waving at me because you're not here.
You guys ain't got no soda?
I got like some spaghetti, some rice, and then I got these egg things, and I just, yeah. I got mashed potatoes. No, do they have potatoes? Yeah, I'm good, I'm good.
I'm limping. So you guys got... Progress. So you were saying that each one of those wheels holds 300 pounds? Yeah. Yeah. But the, the, the failure point would be the frame. Well, <laughs> if it's not true, it's really a failure. <laughs> then it would really be a failure. Most definitely. Finish my food. I'm just going to take it back to my table. Oh no, I just lost all my food. I really messed up my leg, Jess, or my knee. It's all, my whole leg is all swollen up. <laughs> Do you think? We need to. Hey, everyone, we're gonna set up a GoFundMe for Carol to get her a new tripod <laughs> and to help me with the defray the cost of all this. Yes, please don't. Where well, is activating? Your, where is your? Um, I need. I'll put a. Where's your Venmo? Can you put your Venmo up there? I, I have a PayPal, but I gotta figure out how to get that going, and I will put it on my. I'll put it on my web. I'll put it on my Facebook page and on my YouTube page. How's that? Carol, are you still testing? Oh yeah, be ready. Yeah. Okay. Really Yeah, 
Find a lead around here, did you? Yeah, I don't know what's 
shop over there for a second.
<laughs> look, look, she's going to right. <laughs> Just. Yay! They finished the cart. They finished one of the platforms. Awesome, awesome. She's too heavy! <laughs> That's awesome. When's the last time you got a COVID test, hon? Oh, good. You keep getting tested well, every one to two weeks is good. Um, we're collecting data. Um, we got to grab so the car back. We're collecting data. Especially looking for people with asymptomatic symptoms, right? Uh, it's, uh...
So maybe he was just like curious on how to help. I think it's just a bag of bags. Yeah. Okay. No, it was, I think trash was getting put in it, so I was just going to set it aside. I'm going to put it with a little bit. I'm sorry? No, we're all out of it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it is. It's seven o'clock. I'm gonna I'm gonna go down and join somebody downtown. Okay, pack up my stuff.
It's not for sale. Water. For drinking. For drinking. It's not for water. For drinking is the most important. Hola. For some food? For some pasta and some rice?
Wonderful Monday night mutual aid. Mutual aid Monday. Another wonderful mutual aid Monday. Um, get out of here. I'm gonna pack up and uh, start packing up. I'm gonna pack up my stuff. I'm gonna go meet. I'm gonna go meet Helen down on the 16th Street Mall on 6, 16th and Arapahoe. So we'll be down there. If you haven't, if you didn't come by to get your COVID test tonight, come and see me. At 16th and wrap Hall, I'll be there for the next couple hours. So, anyway, love you guys. Remember, it is our duty. It is our duty to fight for our freedoms. It is our duty to win. We must love and support one another. And we have nothing to lose but our chains. Love you guys. See you again soon.